I want to start out and tell you the story this morning that uh, back when I was in college, I had a friend of mine, not a close friend, but you know, the, the roommate of a good friend of mine, so you end up hanging out together regardless, it's just one of those situations, nice guy. And he had a situation where one month he wanted something and he couldn't afford it. So he put it on his credit card and ended the month rolls around and he's like, I can't pay this off. So he just pays the minimum amount. Next month, something rolls around. He wants that. He's like, concert tickets, CD player, because it's back when CDs were still a thing. And he's like, well, I can't afford this. I'll just put it in the credit card. And again, the end of the month comes around and he can't afford it. So he puts it on the credit card and pays the minimum and it just keeps snowballing and snowballing and snowballing. And it got to the point where he couldn't pay any of it back, couldn't even make the minimum payments because everything had snowballed that badly. And he actually wrote it up for the student newspaper. It's kind of one of those, this happened to me, don't let it happen to you sort of things. And what was interesting, what I still remember all these decades later, is that line in there about him having to tell his dad. And he said, it wasn't that I had to cut up my credit cards, because I'd already done that, but having to show him the bill and how much it was and everything else, he said, I was just filled with so much grief, so much guilt, and so much shame. And it's such a common story. I tell you that, and I'm sure as I'm telling you that, you have either known somebody who has lived through that or you've lived through it yourself. We've all seen that story before, getting behind where you can't afford things. And it crushes us. And I tell you that because I want to talk about money today. And I know, I know, as soon as we start talking about money, everybody gets really twitchy. And it's not just because there have been so many bad sermons on money and stewardship over the years, I will own that, that a lot of pastors just don't have the vocabulary for this. And because everybody gets twitchy, they don't want to talk about it, and because they don't talk about it, they don't get good at it, and it gets ugly. But there's a deeper issue. And the deeper issue is this is intertwined with how we think of ourselves. Everything that we think about how we spend money and how we handle our money is intertwined and we see it as a reflection on ourselves, whether we admit it or not. Think about it this way. If I stand up here and talk for 20 minutes about fertility rights in the ancient Near East or talk to you about how Roman roads changed the course of history, you might be interested, might not be, but nobody's going to get upset about it. Nobody's going to think I'm talking about them. But when I'm talking about money, when I'm talking about how we handle our finances, it becomes something very sensitive for us, which is maybe all the more reason that we need to look at it. See, there's a couple different traps that we can fall into. There's a couple different ways that this can hit us. And the first one is, I tell you something, again, I am sure you are familiar with, where you want something, and you got to have it, and then you get it, and you think, i got to get the next thing, and i got to get the next thing, and i got to get the next thing. I'll give you an example. Way back when, back when the earth was young, I sold shoes at Nordstrom's. This was a job, paid the rent. It's a good job. I couldn't complain about it, learned a lot, great people to work with. But here's the thing. I worked on the men's side of things, okay? And only the men's side of things. And I will tell you this, I learned a lot there, and I can tell you I understood men's shoes pretty well by the time I was done. I could tell you what shoe you'd want to wear for a job interview, what you'd wear for a wedding, what you'd wear for casual Friday. And I could probably, if you blindfolded me, just tell by the feel the difference between the $70 shoes, the $300 shoes, and the $500 shoes. But here's the thing. 
periodically I would look across the aisle to the women's side, okay? And their side was three times the size of our side. And once or twice I had to go into their storeroom in the back and I could not find my way out without a GPS and a bloodhound. It was huge. Not exaggerating. Gargantuan, I still have nightmares. But here's the thing. Because I remember talking to one of my colleagues, and she had sold, sold shoes on the women's side for a while, and then she came over to work with us on the men's side. And she said, look, on men's, there's all the issues you deal with. There's fit, there's style, there's size, everything else. But on women's, you get all that, plus you get all the fashion and the class stuff and the name brand stuff. And she said, I could sell you a pair of $70 black high heels, and I can sell you a $300 pair of black high heels, and the only difference between the two is the name brand. And I tell you that because it is such an extreme example of what we all chase, what we all look at, and what that trap is. Now, guys, don't think I'm saying women are any different than men, okay? I just tell you that one because that's where I worked. There's all sorts of issues we all chase. Maybe it's the nice set of golf clubs. Maybe it's the cruise you went on. Maybe it's the cruise you're dying to go on. Maybe it is that new car. But there is always something. And the scary thing is, and if we're self-aware enough, we realize that you want it, and then you get it, and you just want the next thing. 3,000 years ago, Solomon writes in the book of Proverbs, this brilliant bit of wisdom, and he compares that greed to a fire. He's like, look, the fire is never satisfied. It doesn't matter how much wood you throw on there, it will always want more. And here in Wisconsin, we have this nice vision of happy campfires and everybody sitting around eating s'mores and just enjoying the beautiful creation that God has given us. And that's what I grew up with. Growing up in Minnesota, we'd always have the campfires. We'd go up north, we'd have the campfires out by the lake. It was gorgeous. But I will tell you something. That image of fire is not so peaceful in my mind anymore. I spent a few years in California, and one of the things that we first experienced in California was wildfires. We first moved out to California before Joshua was born. Lorianne and I went out to the beach one day, and we come back through a different route. And we can see the smoke plumes rising off of what was known as the La Cañada Fire. And we are probably 20, 25 miles away, and we can see the smoke columns just going straight up to that point where it hits the upper level winds and it just gets the top sheared off. Literally tens of thousands of feet in the air. It is this all-consuming fire. And that's what greed does to us. We're always chasing after that next thing. We're chasing after that next thing, that next thing that we want, and we keep going. When we get it, go for the next thing, and we get it, and we go for the next thing. That was something. And the funny thing is, we know it, and we still can't help ourselves. And Jesus has this great way of talking about it. He says, look, look at the flowers in their fields. Not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed as nice as that. And I was thinking about that. We have these beautiful roses right here this morning. None of us get dressed as nice as that. Not even Solomon in all his riches got to dress as nice as that. And what Jesus is saying, look, all the stuff of this world passes away. And he goes on to say, look, aren't five sparrows sold for a penny? And don't you matter more than a sparrow to God the Father? He's laying that out and saying your self-worth and your self-fulfillment does not get from coming and getting that next thing. It's this beautiful line about 
Our treasures here on earth, the moth, moth and the rust destroy. Think about that pair, those pairs of $300 or $500 shoes we used to sell at Nordstrom's. How long do you think any of them last? How long do you think those golf clubs or that new car lasts? None of them outlast you. And so it's freeing for us to be able to say that my self-worth, our self-worth, doesn't come from those possessions that we have. It doesn't come from those pieces that we acquire. But it comes because we're a child of God. Now, there's a different trap that some of us fall into. And it's not so much the, I want to spend stuff, but it's, I want to control stuff. And so we do this thing where we put all this money away and we think we're going to trust our riches and our wealth to save us. How many of us fall into that trap where we think, I just have all this put away and it's going to be all mine and I don't have to worry about it anymore? Ever thought that? Ever known anybody who's thought that? There's a great passage in Luke chapter 12 where somebody comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, Master, tell my brother to split up, my inherit- split up our father's inheritance with me. And what he's really saying is, Dad died, and the brother's not sharing the wealth from the farm for me. And Jesus is like, mm, let me tell you a story. He says there's a rich guy, and he's got all this great harvest, and so he pulls down his barns, and he puts up new barns to put all this wealth and money and wheat and wine and everything in there, and he goes to sleep, and he says, you know what? Tomorrow we are going to eat, drink, and be merry because we are set for the rest of our lives. And Jesus says, and you know what God said to him? You fool. Tonight, your very life, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. And what Jesus is getting at in this story is as much as we might try and control things, and the money is a symptom, not a cause in this, is that we try and control things, and we try and make everything right, and we try and make everything the way we want it so we can feel secure. And Jesus is like, yeah, it ain't happening. It's never going to be secure. Consider this. We've all heard the stat, the figure, the factoid, whatever it is, that most fights in marriage are about money. My hunch is it's not about money. Money is the symptom. Control is the issue. We want to control things. And we use money to try and do it. We use money to try and control our circumstances. And we have this thing that we want to be in control. And so much of what the Bible is saying is saying, look, you're not God. And you're going to live through these things, and it's going to be okay because you matter to God. And your circumstances are going to be stormy and uncertain. And the thing that you can trust on is that God is always there for you. And that's what we need to go back on. And so for those of you who are looking at things thinking, I want to be in control. I need to be in control. I need to have certainty. Understand that no matter how much you put in the bank, it ain't going to happen. And that it's okay anyway. Because God always loves you. Now let's circle back to the beginning Circle back to the story I told you about credit card and credit card debt. And one of the things that makes it so troublesome for us is this idea that we think we can have it all. And again, to go back to Solomon, Solomon wrote this great line. He said, the borrower is slave to the lender. We know this. We know the truth of what Jesus said, that, that wherever our heart is, that's where our treasure is. Think about it. You know this. 
You've seen this. It's what matters most to you, that possession that you prize. That's where you put your money, and that's where you put your heart, and that's what you can't stop thinking about. How many times have you parked out at the mall somewhere, and you see way out in the end, on the far end of the parking lot, is some really nice car where somebody has cross-parked like across four spaces so nobody parks next to them? We've all seen this, right? I like to take my 14-year-old cheap little Toyota and park really close to them. <laughs> my passive-aggressive streak just comes out occasionally, okay? But the thing is, when we get into the cycle and we chase after stuff, we get ourselves in debt and it owns us. And what God is saying is he says there's all this wisdom, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, about living responsibly and living within your means. And just saying, I don't need to be a slave to whoever's selling, whoever's loaning me money. Now, I know when I use that language, we as Americans are like, mm -mm -mm -mm. it's not us, we're not slaves, mm -mm. no. Leads me to one of my favorite Bible passages. And I think it's one of the funniest passages, but I understand I'm the only one who thinks that. There's this great passage in John 8 where Jesus says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And the people who are listening to him say, What do you mean, set us free? We've never been slaves to anyone. And as they are saying this, they are literally in the shadow of the Roman garrison tower. And before the Romans, they were occupied by the Greeks. And before the Greeks, there were puppet kings. And before the puppet kings, there was the Babylonians and the Assyrians. And before the Babylonians and the Assyrians enslaved them, there was the Jebusites, the Midianites, the Cushites. And before any of those guys, they spent a couple of hundred years in slavery in Egypt to Pharaoh. So to the 2,000 years from Abraham to Jesus, they were probably slaves more times than they were free. And yet they say, we've never been slaves to anyone. And so today, we say we've never been slaves to anyone. Which I want to remind you of the words of Lincoln. Lincoln said, look, we're a nation of free men and women. No foreign army could cross the Blue Ridge Mountains or drink from the Cumberland. If destruction be our lot, we need to be its author and finisher. And so when it comes to slavery, we do it to ourselves. We try and pursue these things, and we put ourselves in debt. We put ourselves in a place where we are more worried about anything of what people think about us or our possessions or being in control than anything. And I tell you all this to say to you, Jesus has made you free. You can walk out of this any time. To those of you struggling with having that thing, that next thing, and always wanting that next thing, remember, that doesn't define you. To those of struggling with control or wanting things to be normal, again, understand that the world is constantly changing, but that God's love for you never changes. And for those of you struggling, trying to figure yourself out and saying, I'm enslaved to my possessions, remember that God loves you always, and Jesus died to set you free. Now, I tell you all this on Vacation Bible School Sunday, which I admit is an odd choice of things, but it's because VBS gives us such a great counterpoint to the message of the world. We had 92 kids come through here this week. 92 squirming, screaming, snotty little munchkins. <laughs> All of them adorable in their own way. And some of them we will never see again. Some of them will grow up here. Some of them, their pictures will be on the wall over there when they get confirmed in ninth grade, and they will grow, go on to live long lives here. There are parents and grandparents who say, yeah, I got confirmed here. I grew up here, and now my kids and my grandkids go here, which is awesome. 
And there are some of those kids who just came because their neighbor invited them, just came because they had the week. And they got to come here and spend the week. And a few years down the road, they might forget all about us. But you know what? That's okay. Because we are here to love them, love each and every one of those 92 kids in the way that Jesus loved us. And share with them and say to them that because God loves you, we love you too. The counterpoint to all the stuff I was talking about, all the way we get enthralled in money and possessions, is to look at a week like we just had. And look at all the people here, the 96 different teenagers and adults that we're helping with this week. The parents who came with their kids. The people who are just part of this congregation say, you know what, I don't have kids or grandkids here, but I just wanted to be part of this and support this. It is looking beyond ourselves. It's this beautiful passage where Jesus talks about, you know, you sow, and it echoes what, what uh, we just heard Bud read for us a minute ago, that we sow generously, and we see the, f- the crops come up generously. We say we're going to spread God's love, and we will see it abound everywhere. That is our call and our hope to give out of what God has richly blessed us with, to be a part of his ministry both here in Washington County and beyond, and to say this is who God has called us to be, to love our neighbors, to be generous, and share that love as we have been loved. Amen.